Good morning, everyone. This is I Believe Bible Fellowship. You're welcome to Bible study. We are located in Houston, Texas, and we're a bunch of believers who love the Lord unashamedly and unreservedly. We study scriptures verse by verse because the Bible says, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. And since we've been doing that, we've seen God move in our lives in very marked ways. We've seen growth. We've seen answer to prayer. We've seen him teach us, strengthen us. We continue to follow after him. Uh, we've been studying the book of Judges. That's the seventh book in the Bible. It is said that um, Samuel wrote the book, but Bible scholars cannot be 100% certain. Since Samuel is considered the last judge, if you like, amongst all the uh, judges. You will hear some Bible scholars say there were 13 judge, judges. You will hear some say there were 12. Um, I doesn't matter which one you subscribe to. The fact remains that Abimelech was a usurper, and he was the only one that ruled for any length of time without him being called and anointed by God. Uh, we are going to start this morning from the 14th chapter where we left off Thursday, and I trust God that he will give us utterance and he will help us. Father, breathe upon your word, as you have always done, teach us, expound scriptures to us, show us the truth that's in your word, that we may be able to walk in the fullness, the truth of the word of God. Lord, <clears throat> the times that we're living in are quite turbulent. We ask that by your grace you will keep us, keep our spirits, keep our souls from wolves in sheep's clothing, keep our spirits, keep our souls in the path of truth and righteousness. And at the end of our journey, on this side of eternity, we may hear you say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. We give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we finished off chapter 13, and I said to you, if I was the one writing the Bible, I'm not. I wasn't, and I'm still not. I would have put verses 24 and 25 in chapter 14. So I'm going to start from 13, 24. Remember what we read in uh, chapter 13, how the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's mother, announced his birth, uh, gave her clear instructions who the boy was going to be and how he should be raised. Her husband was not with her. She went off and told him, and he said, I need to hear this myself. So he besought the Lord. And the Lord was gracious enough to let the angel come back a second time, and he still wasn't there. But uh, she kind of called him, came back, saw the angel. You remember all of that. And in the fullness of time, just as the angel had said, the woman bare a son, called his name Samson. The child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtal. And Samson went down to Timnath, chapter 14, and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people? Thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines. And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath 
And behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with a woman, and she pleased him well. Thank you, Jesus. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother, and he gave them, and they did eat. But he told them not that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made their feast, and so he used the young men to do. And it came to pass when they saw him, that they brought thirty companions to be with him. Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. If ye can suddenly declare it me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you thirty sheets and thirty change of garments. If ye cannot declare it to me, then shall ye give me thirty sheets and thirty change of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle, he may hear it. And he said unto them, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. They could not in three days expound the riddle. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not so? Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother. And shall I tell it thee? And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of her people. And the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, If ye had not ploughed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, and slew thirty men of them, and took their spoil, and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle, and his anger was kindled. And he went up to his father's house. Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. I don't know whether to be angry or feel sorry for Samson. Here is a man whose birth was announced by an angel. Here is a man whom God gave clear instructions concerning. And I'm pretty sure his parents must have told him. No razor came upon his head. And at this time he was old enough to have a wife. So let's even say, you know, they used to marry very early back in the day. I've heard it said, I haven't read it anywhere, but I've heard it said that Mary and Joseph could not have been more than 14, 15, 16, 17 when they got together. I don't know how far true that is. Well, back in the day, they used to get married much earlier than what we do now. So if my hair was not cut from the time I was born till I'm, say, maybe 18, surely I would have asked. And my parents would have told me, this is the reason why we cannot touch your head with a razor. It was not like Samson did not know that he had a special relationship with God. The Bible says in verse 25 of chapter 13, that the Spirit of God moved on him at times, which tells me that Samson was not wholly given to the Spirit of God and to be used by the Spirit of God. Why would the Spirit of God use him at times if God had chosen him from the womb to be the next judge or deliverer or savior 
or Messiah type. If uh, God meant to use him, the Spirit of the Lord would have stayed with him. We see that with Moses. God didn't go back and forth with Moses. God was with Moses all the time. Moses could go and call God and say, God, come, I want to talk to you. And God would show up. But it wasn't like this with Samson. The Spirit of God moved on him at times. And we do the same thing, you and I. We don't always yield to the Holy Spirit. I tell you the most, in my opinion, the, 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 the greatest gift that God could have given us, the power of choice, self-will, is what we abuse the most in our relationship with the Lord. And it should be what should humble us the most. But it's the opposite. That God would condescend to give us the kind of right and privilege that he has given us. It should keep us humble. I was talking to uh, one of us a few days ago. And I said, if God could say to us, commanding, uh, concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. He didn't say, ask ye me. He didn't say, inquire ye me. He didn't say, uh, request ye me. He said, command. If, if, if God can give us such privileges, we can enter at will. We can ask whatsoever we will. That's what Jesus said. If my words abide in you, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will. What you will. Assumption, of course, is that your will is in line with the will of God. Think about who we are to him. Think about the privileges that we have. Think about the things that he has given to us. Dare we then live like infidels? I don't understand it. People say they're struggling with sin. Why are you struggling with sin? I do not understand it. There's no struggle. You know that sin and temptation will come. You know. It's not like you don't. It's not like it creeps up on you and boom, it jumps on you. No. You, you start to think it. You start to caress it. You, you start to look at it. And the more you look at it, the more, the more attractive it becomes. We know these things. And yet we don't nip them in the bud. Samson knew who he was. He knew he was set apart unto God. He knew he was a Nazarite. He knew no razor was to come upon his head. He knew he wasn't supposed to drink. Yet he did the exact opposite of everything God required of him. What on earth could be Samson's excuse? Bible says he went down. I've told you every time you see in scriptures and Abraham went down and Jacob went down. It's always a sign of spiritual declension. He went down to Timnath. Saw a woman of Timnath. One of the daughters of the Philistines. One of the things God kept harping on. Do not marry them. Do not marry them. Do not give your daughters to them and do not take their daughters as wives. They will snare you. They will corrupt you. They will turn you away from me. How can you say you are dating an unbeliever? How can you say your boyfriend is an unbeliever? And how on God's green earth do you go to the altar and you say, I do, to an unbeliever? Why? Because he's wealthy. Why? Oh, because she's whatever men see in women. How? He saw the woman, came home and told his father and his mother, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. He was even definite about it. You know, when we were young and we started having, you know, boyfriends, 
you didn't dare tell your parents. I remember boyfriends used to come back then, they would ask for my brother. So my parents would think he was my brother's friend. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. But of course they knew. But we thought we were fooling them. I've seen one of the daughters of Philistia, Philistia and that's who I want. Go and get her for me. There must have been something wrong with the paradigm of Manoah and his wife's parenting. Why would my son or daughter speak to me like that? What are they smoking? Then his father and his mother weakly, weakly protested. Is there not a woman among the daughters of your bre of my your brethren or among all my people that you're going to take a wife out of the uncircumcised Philistines? Reminded him of the fact that we are a covenanted people. They are not. I tell you all the time, if I stand on a table and you're on the floor, which is easier for me to pull you up to the table or for you to pull me down from the table? If you hang out with them, they'll pull you down. You'll eventually go where they go, do what they do. You will be influenced. Come out from amongst them and be ye separate. It's still valid till tomorrow morning. Reminded him that we're covenanted to God. These are the uncircumcised Philistines. Samson repeated what he said. Get her for me. He wasn't even pleading with his father to say that, uh, you know, I've, I've fallen for this girl and I, I know what, what, what God said, and, but I, I really love her. I'll bring her home. She'll convert. He, he was, no, it was go and get her. That's who I want. Maybe as an only child, he was spoiled. And if you think you're doing that child any good, by not spanking or by not correcting or thinking, oh, she's just a baby. No, she's not just a baby. She knows exactly what she's doing. He or she. They know. Two-year-old, they know. Don't touch. What are they going to do? It's called sin nature. Who did this? Not me. Who taught a three-year-old how to lie? Sin nature. Maybe as an only child, he was spoiled. They let him have his way. Or maybe because an angel came to them, they, they felt, oh, this is a special child. They should have been drumming it in his ears from when he became a teenager. You cannot take a wife out of the strangers around us. Anyway, his father and his mother, the Bible says they did not know that the Lord was, uh, it was, it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. It may have been of the Lord that he sought occasion against the Philistines, but God is not going to use him in sin. God may have been impressing upon him that I'm going to use you to deliver my people from the tyranny of the Philistines. But it's not in sin that God will use him. Listening to a, a video the other day, this, this man of God that they said fell, uh, sleeping with multiple women in, in the church, and he was telling them it's for your salvation. Unless, unless there's a power above God's power. That can hold me like that. Even if it's not in a religious setting. I know it's wrong to commit adultery. You are married. Even though you are my apostle or bishop. Or, or archbishop or whatever you call yourself. Why would you want to sleep with me? Jesus said we will know the truth. And the truth will set us free. 35 and under. You guys need to begin to reach out. To your peers. You speak their language. You understand the way they think. You have been exposed in this church 
to a higher level of thinking because of the amount of word that you have received. You've got to go before the spirit of God and ask him for ways that you can reach them. It's not another fellowship for believers. No. It's, 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 it should be a strategic place of planning. How are we going to get to the unbelieving bunch in our age category? How are we going to present Christ to them so that they know the difference between life and death? It's not another fellowship. And it's not about studying the word and all that. Study of the word is great. I'm not saying don't do it. But after you study the word, come up with a strategy of how you're going to reach these people. Even though it was because of the Philistines that he sought an occasion, God was not going to use him in the midst of sin. He should have gone to God for strategy. Lord, what should I do? How do you want me to come against these people? How are you going to redeem my people from the tyranny of these people? And let God show him what to do. It's not by going to marry them. You cannot commit sin to correct sin. Bible says in verse 5, he went down. This time with his father and his mother. I don't know what they were thinking. Came to Timnath, came to the vineyards, saw a young, obviously saw the girl there because he ended up marrying her. But while they were there, <clears throat> they must have stayed for a length of time. It wasn't just go there, bring the girl and come back. Because we find that Samson was alone when a young lion roared at, against him. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he rent the lion, uh, even though he had nothing in his hands, and he did not tell his parents what he was up to. Are you beginning to catch a glimpse for the character of this person called Samson? The spirit of the Lord will come upon him betimes. He will do things behind his parents, and not let them know what he was up to. The seven says he went down and talked with the woman. And she pleased Samson well. After a time, he returned to take her. Turned aside to see the lion that he had killed. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass. What are you supposed to find in the carcass of a dead animal? Isn't it maggots and flies and evidence of decay? Satan knows how to set us up. If he was filled with maggots and decay and the stench of it, he probably would have crossed the other path and went his way. He has to make it look attractive. He has to make it look harmless. The Bible says a little leaven. Leaveneth the whole loaf. Nah, it really doesn't matter. Yes, it matters a whole lot. And because Satan wanted to set him up, that was the, the, the beginning of the decline of the grace and the anointing on him. It wasn't when his hair was cut off. That was the final blow. Satan knows how to creep up on us. He does. He's not going to come with one big mighty sin. He knows you will recognize it a mile off. So he, I mean, it's a mount. He begins to chew at it little by little, little by little, little by little, little until what you have left is just one tiny thing. And then the killer blow. So he went, and according to, I think it's Leviticus chapter 11, if I'm not mistaken. Let's go there real quick. Who is handling scriptures for me this morning? Thank the Holy Spirit. I am, Pastor Mal. Thank you.
Look at Leviticus 11.27. That's not the one I'm looking for, but it says, And whatsoever goeth upon his paws, among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean to you. That includes a lion. Those are unclean to you. Whoso toucheth their carcass shall be unclean till evening. I don't want to take the time to look for the one I was looking for, but that is enough. Samson either was never taught the law, never had occasion to read the law, or he just downright didn't care. He was going to do what he was going to do anyway, regardless of what Jehovah had to say. And some people who call themselves Christians are still living like that. You can't. Scripture says, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and started to eat it. This is a graphic picture of sin. Something that's been dead a few days or weeks. I don't know how long it takes to, to actually uh, uh, rot. Why would bees go and make their honeycomb in the carcass of the lion? He didn't even stop to think. How hungry can you be that you cannot wait to get home before you eat? He got home, gave some to his father and his mother. Out of curiosity, I would have asked, especially if I tasted it and it was extra, you know, pure virgin honey. I would have said, oh, this is really nice. Where did you buy it, son? They didn't think to ask him. They too took it and they ate it. Again, second time, he told them not that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So Samson knew that what he was doing was wrong. He knew. That's why I say it is difficult for me to commit sin. That's iniquity. When you sit down and you fashion it, and you plan it, and you execute it. We all sin, every last one of us. As long as we're in this flesh, we will contend with this flesh. But to sit down and know that God has spoken specifically concerning something, and for me to go ahead and perpetrate whatever it is, I'll die before it happens. What, 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 what on earth does Satan have to offer us? If we consider who we are, one, if we consider what he has done for us, two, if we consider what the price he paid for us to be who we are, three, if we consider that there are consequences, four, by the time I think through one, two, three, I've changed my mind. If at all I entertained it. This is how we must live. Circumspectly. Intentionally. So that anytime God needs somebody, I'm ready. I'm not first panicking and, and wondering, am, am I right? Uh, is there sin? Mm -mm. Lord, I'm ready. 24-7. That's how we should live. And we can live like that. We absolutely can. His father went down onto the woman, I guess to fulfill the rights of asking for her hand in marriage. And so Samson made a feast for so used the young men to do. They had begun to copy the, the traditions and the ways of the people that they failed to drive out. 
if you don't quit being friends with that guy or those guys or those girls, if you don't start being friends with them, they will influence you. And that ought not to be. If this room were pitch dark, if I strike one match, it will light up the room. That's how powerful the light in you is. You should be the one influencing them. They are calling the people on, on social media influencers. Why do you think they call them influencers? Stop and think for a minute. It's because they are influencing people. I know people who lie on social media. I'll try to lie. And if you didn't know them, you would think they were telling you the truth. I told you I have a friend, a friend I grew up with. Husband lives upstairs. She lives downstairs. Same house. Don't talk. Trying to eat. He comes down, makes rice or makes a sandwich or whatever. But on their wedding anniversary, if you read the post, you will run outside. The first man you see, you say, please marry me. Please marry me so I can, I can say I have a husband and I can write such glorious things about my husband. Complete lie. They're not called influencers for nothing. That was the custom. Bible says it came to pass, they brought 30 companions to be with him. That was the custom of the Philistines. 30 companions to do what? Bachelor's night. You see where sin came from? What did they do at Bachelor's night? I've never been, one, been to one, but I've seen it on TV. His friends encourage him to sexual sin. This is your last night of freedom. Think about it. So he's going to sleep with a whore the day before our wedding. Then on our wedding night, he will come with that same body to be united with me. I'm simple for the riddle. <clears throat> it's gambling as far as I'm concerned. It was on serious. He told them, I'm going to tell you a riddle. If you can solve it, I will I will give you 30 sheets <clears throat> and 30 change of garments. Samson held a wedding party for seven days. How wasteful is that? Is right there. If you can declare it, this is what I'll give you. If you cannot declare it, then you guys will give me that. Give them the riddle out of the eater came forth meat, out of the strong came forth. He was even boasting in his iniquity. As a Nazarite, he was not supposed to touch any unclean thing. Not only did he touch, he ate from it. And then he has created a riddle that he's sharing on his at his wedding party. Of course, <clears throat> on the seventh day, they still couldn't figure out what he was saying. So they came to this wife. Who obviously is not a wife. Because if you're a wife, you will cover your husband. Entice him, they said. What kind of a wife is that? When you marry of the children of Philistines, that's the kind of wife you will marry. Entice him so that he can tell you the riddle so that you can come and tell us. Because we, we've tried in the last seven days and we can't figure it out. So she went and she started crying. I see a couple of men on the call. I don't know how to carry yourself. 
as a man in the home. I love you, but I will not tell you. As a covenant between me and my God. You can cry. I'll go and buy you chocolate and flowers and, and a box of tissue. What else do men give you guys? Well, I didn't get all of that in Nigeria. We don't do that. I will take you shopping. I will do everything. I won't tell you. That's a covenant between me and my God. My wife, you need to honor that and you need to respect that. He's the head of the union. He has a right to withhold information. He does. And if your heart trusts God 100% and your heart trusts him, then you will rest. I don't have to know. It's not my headache. You're the head. And if it goes awry, guess who God is going to call? It's not me. Eve ate the fruit. God called Adam. He saw Eve. He saw her take the fruit. He saw her bite into the fruit. He didn't say one word. He called Adam. Have you eaten of the fruit that I told you not to eat? Entice your husband so that he can tell you the riddle. And if you don't, this is what we're going to do to you and your father's household. So she came and she started crying. You hate me. You don't love me. If you love me, you will tell me. <laughs> I'll pass a box of tissue. She wept before him. Verse 17. The whole seven days. While the feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day. Listen to what the Bible says. He told her because she lay sore upon him. Scripture says it's better to dwell in the corner of the roof than to be in the same house with a wife who is troublesome. He told her the riddle and she went promptly and told her people. Men of the city came, of course, and told him. <clears throat> and listen to what Samson said. I told you Samson was just, he's in the same box as, as Joshua, as far as I'm concerned. He's not my favorite person in the Bible. If you had not plowed with my heifer, he's calling his wife a heifer. What kind of husband is that? If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. The Bible says this riddle the Lord came upon him, he went down to Ascalon, killed 30 men, misusing the anointing. What did I say? Misusing the anointing. We're having this seminar on how to be free from spiritual abuse, domination, and control. There are people who misuse the anointing. You must know enough for you to be able to recognize it. So because of a stupid riddle, that you made during your wedding ceremony, 30 innocent souls are going to die. Is that the purpose of the anointing? Or the purpose of the anointing is to deliver Israel from the tyranny of Philistines. That was the assignment. That was the purpose of the anointing. Well, and Murphy says people didn't understand his assignment. His assignment is to take back the culture. One million William Morphys cannot take back the culture. The culture belongs to Satan. He's the God of this world. He is. And we, the church, who are supposed to keep him in check, we're busy serving his purpose. 
I drove by a church yesterday coming back home. They had a rainbow flag saying all are welcome. How? All are welcome in the house of God. Oh, that should be a known fact. But I don't have to put up a rainbow flag and say all are welcome. To do what? The church that's supposed to be holy and righteous and carry the grace, carry the anointing, carry the power to checkmate these things in society. They're busy playing patty cake. He went and killed 30 innocent guys so that he could take their garments and go and pay for the pledge or the or the riddle or whatever that he did. Bible says in verse 19, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled. Kindled for what? Completely unruly individual. What, what was his anger? His anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. So he left the, the lady and went back home. Obviously, he felt betrayed by her. So he left her and went away. And guess what the father of the girl did? Samson's wife was given to his best man. And the Bible doesn't say best man, but it says Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. But you know, Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy of God, still rings through all of this nonsense that this man has done. Because in spite of it all, God did not change his mind concerning him. God was still wholly given to use him to set his people free. That's what I was saying at the beginning of this lesson. That when we think about the goodness of God, it should humble us. When we think about what he has done for us, it should humble us. When, when we think about the sacrifice, when we think about his mercy, when we think about his goodness, we should, we should want to please him. And not take for granted for one nanosecond anything he has done for us. In spite of all of this craziness, God is still going to use him for the sake of his people, Israel. Thank you, Jesus. Any questions, any thoughts? Abby, good morning. Good morning. Um, I just have a comment about Samson. I feel like his parents enabled him to become like this, like you were saying in the beginning. Hold on. And um, because they were the one, like they didn't do anything about his behavior. They didn't. Um, they didn't say anything. Um, and I feel like he was probably a spoiled kid because, you know. They they knew the anointing over, that he had on his life, so they were like, "Oh, you know, he he has this anointing and he's God's favorite or whatever." And uh, let's spoil him rotten and do whatever he says, and you know, and I feel like that's how they raised him. So, so that's how you know he became like this. I grew up. Yep, it's quite possible. Especially since she was barren for a long time. And then she then finally conceived. 
the child became an egg. Any other person, any thoughts? Come on, class. None of us can identify with Samson. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Hmm. All right. If uh, we don't have any comments, we can move on. I don't know how. I say something, but I can't find how to raise my hand. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good, mo good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, oh, I don't know why I couldn't find how to raise my hand. But anyway, I was going to say when you were talking about how um, abusing the anointing, and we see anointing being abused in these churches on um, social media, you know, anytime you get on there. And it's, it's almost as if, it's almost as if, people just can rise up today and just start a church and see when it, you, you almost can go back. If you look at the, and I'm going to say pedigree for lack of a, a better word. If you look at the pedigree, when, when you don't see a pedigree there, you, you almost know it, unless they have such a, a miracle calling of God, these people are going to are in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I, my heart, um struggles with some of the things that I see mm. of people being led astray. And one of the things that you know I've always heard through my time in ministry is it, it looks like every so many years people want to change and the the words they use is we need to reach the young people. We've got to changes and what i have witnessed through the years is that people want to become like the like the people they're trying to reach for example you want to reach young people they start dressing like young people the torn up and all this stuff trying to fit in allegedly to win them but these people are not being one like that and, you know, I'm old school. And my thing is this. You get, you get these young people the way we got it. Nobody, nobody changed the way they delivered the gospel when we were coming up. You went to church and you sat there and you got the gospel. So I don't, I don't know what the answer God's word is to convict it's the hammer in the word. It's the sword of the word. It divides soul and asunder. Preach the word. You don't have to change anything. I, I, what really bothers me as a minister and as a pastor, what bothers me is to see how the inside of the church has changed so much like the world. It's like you're not walking into church anymore. When you walked into church, you had a rough just You're breaking up. Just You're breaking you up. had respect. Oh, okay. I, I guess it's my internet. I, this thing goes in and out. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. When you walk into church, you have you had a reverential fear of God when you walked in the church. You knew you were somewhere where you needed to straighten up. If you were cutting up before you got in there, you had a, a presence of mind to straighten your act up and just be quiet. You know, it was just a, a, a place of respect. And it's not there. I don't see it there anymore. There are places you can't go, but... Young people are not going there, but we've always had young people through time. So young people have to come in. But to me, it's the word that's going to get them in. That word is designed to convict. It's designed to smash. It's designed to do everything that all of these different things we're coming up with, that we're trying to do. I don't convict. 
and how heavy that conviction is, that's what's going to win them. That's what I had to say. Now, I got to uh, somebody tell me where I can raise my hand. What is the the tab for that? It's called reactions. What is it called? Reaction. Reaction. Oh, I see it. Okay, thanks. Okay, right. <laughs> thank you. I mean, you are. All right, I'm done now. I'm raise it. I'm a trap. You are on point, uh, Reverend Cynthia. Uh, truth be told, um, the nonsense that thank you. Thank you. Men and women of God are trying to do wearing torn jeans, wearing wearing whatever uh, to church, uh, not wanting to put on suits anymore or a tie anymore and all of that, you know. Truth be told, these self-same ministers, if they're called to a business meeting, they will go in business suits and tie. You know? And, and we you don't know, have to we don't have to be like the world to win the world. Truth be told, you can't win a fly. You I mean the smallest, the smallest whatever that God created, you cannot change. Not to come and talk of a whole human being made in his image and likeness. Like you said, it, it's the word. Uh -huh. I, I like the way you put it. That it's a hammer, it's a sword, it's a knife, it's all of those things. It will cut, it will smash, it will it will turn around, it's a bleach, it will cure it. It's everything. It, it, the power is in the word. It's not in the smoke and the lights and the, the red is flashing and blue is flashing. And, that's theatrics. Teach the word. But we find out that... Uh, and you know that's why with itchy with itchy ears, Satan has provided ministers who will preach stuff that itchy ears want to hear. So it, it's the remnant folks like us and all others. We're not the only uh -huh. one. Uh, uh, Elijah thought he was the only one. Said I'm the only one. Lyrical. Said go and sit down. I have 750 that have never bowed the knees to Baal. So we're not the only ones. But I know there are there are several churches that are <clears throat> waking up to the fact that we need to teach the word, the word, not stories, not anecdotes, mm -hmm. not not no. Don't come and build something around, you know, one one piece of scripture and think you've done me. No, teach me the word so that I can stand. You're not going to be there the day Satan shows up in my house. I don't even have your number to be able to mm -hmm. call you. Oh, Satan is sitting in my living room. Teach me what I need to know so that when I see him, I can tell him, you're in the wrong place. The door is open. Go. And I pray that God will begin to raise many more ministries and many more churches to become aware of this thing. That the word, it's the word first before anything. In the beginning was the word. And it should be the beginning of any and everything that we do. Don't. Uh, oh, can I add one more thing before you move on? Yeah. I thought, okay. Don. Don. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I wanted to piggyback on Sister Cynthia because I know for a fact it is the word. I don't care what you're going through because when God brought me, I know where he brought me from. And it, it was the word that delivered me. It was the word that convict me first to bring me to my knees. It's the word that transformed me and continued to transform mm -hmm. my life. It is the word. And now what you're seeing is so scary. Oh my God. It is so scary what I'm seeing across social media. Even the ones who grew up, the the influencers now, some who grew up in holiness, now they just straight away and they're teaching foolishness, but got the house packed and the whole house is going to hell, including the men and women of God. That is the most scariest thing that I'm seeing right now. And if you try to give the truth, you get, the end time, you get backlash. But it is so scary what we are seeing now. From the foolishness that you saw on Watch Night Service to what he just said yesterday, how in the world are you still sitting in, under that roof? It's the most scariest thing, but the itchy ears, you 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 want you want to hear what you want to hear because you don't want to be held accountable for your foolishness. He put out another mean? video. 
They put out another video saying that's, that what you're talking, that's the one I'm talking about. Because you don't have money. That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 foolishness. I heard a pastor, a pastor said that it's so much noise in the church. I had to post it yesterday. It's so much noise in the church because there's no power. No power. And now you, God's raising up teachers, bringing teachers back, such as yourself and many others. You got to know God. You got to know his character. You got to know who he is for you to stand. And you got to have a spirit of discernment. Ask God to king your discernment because I don't understand how you follow a, a train in a rail off the cliff. I don't understand it. It's really sad. It is sad. And, and now never... your eyes see that scripture. Narrow is the way, but broad. Oh my God. At first I couldn't understand it. Now I see what God is saying. It's going to be so many people on that wide road. Yep. He said, few there be that find the way of life. Few. Yes. Few. <laughs> my God. But I thank you for, uh, Pastor Mo, you being bold. Go ahead and uh, set the social media on fire. And it, 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 you got to get some folks saved and shut the mouths of the devil. I, I, I'm sick of it. Yeah. Yeah. Saw another video. Uh, this minister at his pulpit and what looked like, you know, elders or whatever around him. Talking about in Psalm 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm like Psalm 316. All right, maybe it was a slip of tongue. That happens. Have somebody kept going. See, Sometimes you want to say something, something else comes out. And I'm still listening. And he goes on to quote it. Whosoever believeth in him shall not prosper. Ah. That's my, that's my Nigeria. I heard that one. Shall not prosper. Whoever believeth in him. And the people around him, they didn't I heard it. it. They did not flinch. It was like he quoted the word. People don't open up the Bibles no more. They trust every word to come out of the pastor's mouth. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It, 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 we're in a time you got to know the word for yourself. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. Many people trying to teach the word, trying to preach the word, and they're not schooled. They're not trained. They haven't spent time in the word themselves. Nor spent time in his presence to hear what he got to say. To tell the folks, you talking out your doggone emotions. I'm sorry. Let me let me let me get off this. <laughs> you talking out your emotions. Tell me how to get out. Can you can you do that? Tell me how to get out the paper bag. Andrew. You're welcome to IBBF. Your hand is up. Hello. On. Thank you. Um, so there's just a couple things I just want to point out. You know, talk about how young people don't have respect, you know what I'm saying, when they come into church anymore, they come in clothes, come in just, uh, just clothes that they were casually wear. The problem is, is that the lack of discipline for the generations, because it dwindled. And you can see a lot of things started going to, to the gutter when they kicked God out of the government and when they kicked him out of our schools when they just basically gave him a pink slip, okay? The issue, the, the thing is, is that... Andrew, can we see your face? I like what I'm hearing. Are you a young one? Um, I, Hello, sir. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to, me, to me, you're a young one. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> That's God. You are so it's, on point. You are so on point. That's where it started from. The thing is, it's like this. And you have to end the when you when the when it was being stated, the question is this is the Bible archaic? And my question would be no, the Bible is eternal. So it doesn't matter what time period it is, the word of God can be delivered to a point of understanding or Anybody on generation, 
You know what I'm saying? I mean, grand, grand time now where that not not everybody can is going to re- not not everybody in the younger generation is going to resonate with contemporary gospel. They want gospel. They they will resonate with a gospel that has like a base to it, you know, or a little bit of. It's like the music is communicating differently, but you still can give the same message. You know, it's I I, I put it to you like this: when I got when I got saved, I struggled with music because I was like, listen, I can't. I, I'm I'm. God bless Mahalia Jackson. Amen. But I, you know, I, I'm the type of person where that, okay, I got my little Honda Civic, I'm a tuner cat, and I want to bump something. But I don't want to bump no secular music. God, please let me know if there's some music out there you got that I can bump in my trunk. And sure enough, I got introduced to gospel hip hop. I got introduced to people like Michael Peace. And I'm like... Okay, this is good. Through that, when I would see somebody, if I had a gospel CD on me, a gospel hip hop CD, I'm I'm hooking them up, and you know what I'm saying, and they receive it. I give them something that's old school. I'm sorry, but if I give them something like that's older, that's the equivalent of like classical music or something of that nature. It's it's going to be a different type of reception. And the question is, are they going to be more likely to play it? You know, so it's it's this. We serve an eternal God. We serve a God that's past, present, and future. So omniscient, omnipresent. You know, sometimes you just have to meet people where they are and just let the Holy Spirit deal with them. You know, I mean, I, I still go to church in jeans, but then again, our church is, you know, it's casual dress. But I'll tell you one thing, you know, I, our ladies are are casual. They're not going to be dressed inappropriately. Our men don't go in there, go dressed inappropriately either. You know, so it's like this. Times are changing. The word of God stays the same. But at the same time, you know what I'm saying? We, we have to still rely on the holy spirit you know what i'm saying those 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 men they i'm sorry i'm rambling now but you know what i'm saying there's some men that may not come dressed the way you want them to you know what i'm saying they may wear a, a nice three-piece suit but still have on some like 200 dollars jordans and to them that's that's the equivalent of a very nice shoe mm. some men just don't have that knowledge because why the knowledge is being lost I, I they have don't know how to buy a suit. Their father, they don't have a father to teach them. We're losing, we're losing the family. And you know what? The devil loves that. Because why? And not many people bring this up, but Jesus had a family. He had a mother, a father, brothers and sisters. There was no broken home. He didn't come from a single parent family. He came from a complete family. And and that's not, I don't hear that but I recognize it. And because he had a father, he had Joseph. Of course he had God, but he also had Joseph, an earthly father, teach him things, teach him how to be a man. Ladies, you, the men are being lost. I don't have any problem with coming to church in jeans. I, I preach in jeans. Yesterday I, I had a pair of, uh, uh, what am I going to call it? Leggings, if you like. And, and a t-shirt and a nice jacket on it, but but I'm not going to wear jeans that's torn and be on the pulpit trying to preach. I'm not going to do that, but I do wear jeans, and when the occasion demands, then I dress up formally. Like when we had the covenant service on the first Sunday of this year, I dressed up formally. If it's Easter, I will dress up formally. But I'm not going to come in jeans that are torn in the thigh or, or torn in the knee, and all in the name of trying to reach young people. I will not do it. it and this, I, I don't this, expect for you to. You know yeah, what I'm saying? I don't expect for you to. This self same well, young people, if they're invited to 1600 Pennsylvania, they won't go there in torn jeans. 
Mm -hmm. Why would I go to church in torn jeans or inappropriate uh, whatever? All of that is even minor as far as I'm concerned. It's more of the dissemination of the word of God. Don't come and give wrong interpretation. Don't teach if you're not called to be a teacher. Don't, don't start a church if God has not called you to be a pastor because if there's a call and a grace on your life, it will be evident. It will be evident. But when we have people, like the guy who was saying, for God so loved the world, whosoever believeth in him shall not prosper. And it was recorded. The video is all over the place now. What video is this? I'm sorry. It was on Instagram. I came in late. I'm sorry, Pastor. <laughs> I came in late. It's but good. um there's, there's a lot of foolishness on Instagram, on YouTube. You know, it's definitely you have to know the word to um separate it all. But yeah, this yeah, I it's crazy. I know. I see you're driving, Andrew. Would you do me a favor when you can before this call? Mm -hmm. Drop your number. In a direct message to me, please. So so I can call you later on. We'd like to get to know you better. Sure. No Thank problem. You. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Abby. Good morning. Um, I just had had a couple of thick comments, I guess. Um, speaking about the the pastors and stuff these days, I feel like um we live in the cancel culture. And a lot of pastors, um, and obviously the Bible doesn't line up with the world. So um, pastors are not preaching the word because they don't want to get canceled. They don't want to lose their money. They don't want to, um, you know, be canceled or whatever. So I feel like a lot of the pastors aren't preaching the word, word because of that. Um, and obviously the people in the crowd um, are saying amen and amen because they've never heard the word probably. They don't know. They don't even know that he's not saying the right things. Mm -hmm. um, or if they do, they probably wouldn't be in there saying amen and, and shouting and hollering and stuff. Um, God said, what does it profit a man? He gains the whole world, but he loses his soul. Yeah. So if you're out there trying to please the people by bending the gospel, or sometimes outright lying about what the word really means, you're putting your own soul in jeopardy. Yep. Because they're going to be judged more harshly. And, uh, and I think it's James, James 3, 1 or something like that. It says, don't seek to be a teacher because you're going to be judged more stringently. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, I think that we should... Um, and I'm glad there's people on social media that are, you know, making videos about how he is not saying the right things and how this is wrong. Um, because, um, people, you know, reading the comments and stuff, people are like, how are there's people in there saying amen and all this stuff. Well, I mean, yeah, that's wrong, obviously, but, um, think about it. They they may have been in that church for their whole lives. They they have made grown up that in that church and never have gotten the word, you know. So the real word. Talking about council culture, he counseled us that commented. Because the next time I went there, he had turned up comments. Yeah. So no one can read what people are saying. Yep. So I, I don't mind being counseled. That's not a problem. As long as Jehovah doesn't cancel me, I'm good. Exactly. And the word, the word of God, and people are so soft. People are so soft today. They can't hear something that makes them, um, they can't, they can't be wrong. They're everybody. I mean, not everybody, but I'm saying a lot of people just think they know it all, think they're the right, think they're doing the same thing. They can't ever take um, any, any advice or any, you know, conviction, especially from the Holy Spirit. You know, if you're getting convicted by the Holy Spirit, like, I don't know why you haven't changed, but if, if, you know, people on here are hearing you say the word, it's not, it's not you that's saying it, it's the word, the word is saying it to them. And it's yeah. like, oh, Pastor Mo, she's just so mean. And, you know, she's just out to get us all in and all this. And no, it's not Pastor Mo, it's the word of God. And that's what you're preaching. That's what you're teaching us is the word of God. So 
you should feel uneasy because the word of God is holy and obviously we're in flesh. So we can't, you know, we should feel uneasy about these things, but I mean, I feel like we all, you know, on this call probably know that. Um, but I was going to point out that in, in this, um, in judges 14. So in judges 13, we go to, you know, the spirit of the Lord, um, you know, he came to Samson's parents or whatever. And then 14 starts off as Samson went down to Timna, is that how you say that? Mm -hmm. Timna, and saw a young Philistine woman there. Why was Samson even in a Philistine city to begin with? Why was he, he was in, and that tells me that he was trying to be something that he wasn't. He was, he was putting himself in, in that culture and in that, it, with those people, because if, if he wasn't, if he was, you know, oh. discerning and stuff, he'd be like, I ain't even gonna go around those people, you know. I that they, whatever they're doing is wrong. Um, so I'm not even gonna be in their cities, I'm not gonna, you know, be around them because and I feel like he just Samson was just off. Samson Samson was spoiled. There's no doubt about that. Oh. He was arrogant, he was prideful, he was disobedient to God, to parents. Uh and Samson. Not once was it recorded that he prayed. Mm -hmm. The only time he prayed was when he had lost the power, his eyes had been gouged out, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, you know, because those are points we're going to talk about when we get to chapters 15 and 16. The only time Samson prayed was just before he died. Yeah. So prayerlessness was a big problem. Being impudent, being, being arrogant, being prideful, uh, disobedient to parents, and we see the same spirit at work in in our men today and people yeah. today. Exactly, and that was my second point: is that Samson was he would, and I don't want to, you know, call out men, but I see a lot of men with the same ego, the same pride, the same. Um, I can tell people what to do, and they just have to do it because I'm just, you know anointed or I'm I got this this pride and ego in me because when he said to uh Delilah I haven't I haven't even explained it to my father and mother so why should I explain it to you that's your wife bro that's your wife and and I like how you pointed out the uh Leviticus eleven twenty seven because he he was out there touching carcasses like <laughs> he was disobeying you know the word of God in the old testament so in the law like I just think he was when you read when you read these because when you grow up in and just people are like oh Samson you know he was a strong but when you actually read the word and you you're studying this man and his actions and and looking closely to what he was doing like he was off he was way off yep but then like I said look at the mercy of God in spite of all of the nonsense. God was still going to use him to the praise and to the glory of his name. That's why we need to understand grace. Grace is not license to sin. Grace is power to walk away from sin. Exactly. Um, whose hand is up again? Me. That's just it. One more. Uh, is your hand up, Laura? No, oh, no, it's done. Don, go ahead. Don. I, I was just going to say. Every time I look at who was just talking about, I just see a deformity in him. You remember how King Nebuchadnezzar went up against God? Mm -hmm. That's why I see, that's that spirit that I see on him. Mm -hmm. And he has gone so far that pride won't let him come back to repent, to say I'm wrong. What I said was wrong. What I allowed you to do in this house. The consecrated house of God is wrong. There's no way that the spirit of God is in that place. That is a scary place to be is, in. Is, is it a consecrated place? It's not. Uh -huh. It's like what Reverend Cynthia was saying. Right. All right. You walked into a church, even till, till today. You know, when we were in UK last summer, um, uh, my brother... Uh, Jay and myself, we had to go into town 
and he needed to do some banking. Across from his bank was an old cathedral. So I said, let's let's go in and see, because I, I love going into those old cathedrals and just looking around. So we opened the door and there was a small service going on. And I wasn't going to just shut the door and walk away. It's a service, it's my father. So I walked in and we sat down. And of course they noticed us. So when they finished, the vicar came around to, you know, to greet us. By then my brother had finished and he had come into the sanctuary as well. The service was ongoing, so he sat by me. And the vicar and some elders came and they greeted us. And of course they knew my brother because my brother is the secretary of music for the district of, you know, the Methodist Church, uh, the Methodist Conference in the UK. Uh, so they knew him very well. And so he then introduced us properly with our names and all of that, you know, and, 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 and the lady said to me, um, are you an author? I said, yes. She said, I've read your books. I said, you've read my books. Yeah. She said, yeah. She got someone on uh, Amazon and she's read my books and we started to talk. But the reverence inside that cathedral built in 16 something and it's still standing. You can't go in there and shout. You know, nothing wrong with shouting. The Bible says we shout. I shout to church. But I understand what Reverend Cynthia was saying that no matter what you were doing outside, once you came inside the sanctuary, you, you self-autocorrected. That's the word. And we've lost that. We've lost that. So our kids that are growing up don't see the reverential fear that we have for God. And so we now look like the ones that are weird. See, and uh, remember, and remember, the leaders used to correct us. They would pull us aside right. Right. and correct us, and we can say nothing. Well, back in our time, Don, your mom could call me to order, and yes. my mom would have no problem with it. Not whatsoever. If you correct someone else's child today. Oh it's yeah, not acceptable anymore. Yeah. So even if the kid is misbehaving, you know, there's nothing you can't do. Now the, mother is like, the mother is correcting the child. The child is not listening. So who are you? It's, 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 uh, yeah. God just has to supernaturally help the yeah. remnant that he has preserved for himself. Mm -hmm. And to do the great exploits, to be strong and do the great exploits, we're really going to have to get in our word and know <laughs> so we can demonstrate. Let's, let's go on so that we can Take one more chapter. I hope to finish. Uh, yeah, we'll do four. We did 14. We'll do 15. I wanted to do 14, 15, 16 this morning. <clears throat> but it's okay. 15. But it came to pass within a while after, in the time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid. And he said, I will go into my wife, into the chamber. But her father would not suffer him to go. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shot and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. And the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you. And after that, I will cease. And he smote them, hip and thigh, with a great slaughter. And he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock, Etam. Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are ye come up against us? And they answered, To bind Samson are we come up, to do to him as he hath done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went to the Etam, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? 
what is this that thou hast done unto us? As, as they did unto me, so have I, have I done unto them. And and they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. Samson said unto them, Swear unto me, that ye will not fall upon me yourself. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand. But surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax, was burnt in fire, and his hands loosed from off his, and the bands loosed from off his hands, and he found a new jawbone of an axe, of an ass, and put forth his hand and took it, and slew a thousand men were therewith. And Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand, and called that place Math Lehi. And he was sore at thirst, and called on the Lord, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. And now shall I die for thirst, and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? But God clave an hollow place that was in the, in the jaw. There came water thereout. When he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore he called the name thereof En Hakore, which in Lehi, which is in Lehi unto this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines twenty years. One thing should do special thank offering that Mo is not God. First of all, I will take my anointing away. And I will discipline you. The Bible says uh, during wheat harvest, he decided to go back to Timnath to go and visit his wife. So he abandoned her. When he got there, the father would not allow him into the room. Told her, I thought you were done with her because she betrayed you. She uh, went and told the riddle to the uh, to your companion. So I gave her to your friend. But see, I have a, a younger daughter who is who is more beautiful. Again, that's Satan setting him up. <laughs> uh, take her instead of the first one. Samson said, now I have every reason to come against you guys. Right? He, got, he caught 300 foxes. He took five brands turned them tail to tail and tied the firebrand to their tails, set the firebrands on fire, drove them into the cornfield of the Philistines and burnt the whole thing up, right? Of course, when the Philistines found out, um, they took vengeance on the Timnite and they killed, uh, killed the man and his entire household. And look at Samson in verse 7. He wasn't appeased. He was not appeased at all. Even though um, the the, the Tim, Tim Knights, if you like, had seized uh, this man, his former father-in-law, and killed him and his entire household, Samson, Samson still was not appeased. He was still going to do more. So he smote them, heap and thigh, with a great slaughter. The Bible doesn't tell us how many. Then he went and sat on the rock, Eta. Philistines then went and pitched their tents against Judah, knowing that they could overrun Judah. They were the masters at that time. All right? They pitched and spread themselves in a place called Lehi. So the men of Judah, cowering. Can you imagine? This is the Judah in chapter 1. That God appointed. Out of God, you've got to you've got to guard jealously the anointing that's on your life. It's not only pastors that are anointed, all of us are. If you are in Christ, you are anointed. That word Christ means the anointed one, it's not his surname. We are all anointed, and to be holding pastors to this standard. And everybody else in the pew 
to another standard is wrong. Adultery in the pulpit is just as bad as adultery in the pew. Adultery in the pew is just as bad as adultery in the pulpit. God doesn't have two standards. One for pastors, one for the people. Yeah, they're not anointed, they're not called, they're not, they're not, they haven't been to Bible school, so they can sin. No. We are all anointed, and you have to preserve the anointing, the power of God, the grace of God, the ability to be able to be used at the drop of a hat. God needs somebody, you're there. We carry the self same anointing in equal measure. He's not a respecter of persons. It's a place for honor. The Bible tells us that very clearly. Honor those that are laboring over us spiritually. But when honor crosses over into worship, then there's a problem. Three thousand men of Judah went to Samson. Come and save us. This is the same Judah that God said, I have appointed Judah. I have given him the land. But I told you in chapter one, his mind was so small. All he was concerned about was his own allotment. Simeon, come and help me. Let's get my allotment back. And I'll follow you. I will get your allot allotment back. But what about the remaining ten tribes? God said, I've given you the land. The same word he gave Moses, he gave to Joshua, he gave to Judah. But Judah did not do it. What are the things you're tolerating in your life because you're afraid? What are the things you're tolerating in your life because you think it will have consequences? There's no consequence greater than the consequences of sin. I'll be homeless. On the streets. Before I, I entertain iniquity in this house. Three thousand men. Because they knew how strong he was. So they went. Said look at what you have done to us. Something said I didn't do anything to you. What they did to me is what I did to them. So anyway. They have come up against us. And you know we have no might. Basically, that's what they were saying. So we want to take you, come peaceably. We'll bind you and we'll go and hand you over to them. And whatever happens thereafter, fine. <laughs> Some say, I swear to me that you're not going to kill me. Say, no, we have no reason to kill you. We just want to give you to the Philistines so that they can go. We don't have the power to fight them. So they took him, they handed him to the Philistines because God has an assignment on his life. God came on the scene again. Verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The cords that they used to tie him fell off like flax as burnt with fire. Conveniently, there was a jawbone at hand. What you need to stand against the enemy, God will put within your reach. Conveniently, there was a jawbone that he could fight with. If you make up your mind that I'm not going to compromise, God will give you victory after victory after victory after victory after victory. He will do it. Picked up the jawbone and he slew a thousand men. And pride began to speak. Not that the spirit of God of the Lord came upon him that we read in verse 14. He began to speak pridefully. I I've seen a thousand men. Something like it was your power. Or your anointing. Or your strength. First Corinthians 4, 7. says, what do you have that you were not given? That you're acting like you're all of that in a bag of chips. What do you have that you were not given? The Bible says the excellency of the power may be of him. Not of any man. Oh, I laid hands. As I just laid hands, they just fell. 
They get ready for a holiday, a safari holiday in the wilderness. The one that God told Nebuchadnezzar to go, go on safari for seven years. By the time you come back after seven years, maybe there'll be some sense in your head for you to know that whatever you are doing, it's by my leave that you do it. Right. Hips upon hips. With the jaw of an ass have I slain a thousand men. He threw away the job. And listen to how he spoke to God. Verse 18. He was thirsty. I would be too after slaying a thousand men. So that has given this great deliverance. Talking to the Lord God Almighty. The one who is able to snuff you. Like you never existed. You have given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. Oh, Samson, you know you're his servant. You know. And you're living the way you're living. Doing the things you're doing. Saying the things you're saying. Going to where you're going. What are you doing in the land of the Philistines? How dare you take a wife from there? You know. And yet you're doing it. You have given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. And now shall I die for thirst? Samson, who are you talking to? You should be grateful that Jehovah God is not Mo. And Mo is not Jehovah God. You're talking to me like that. Shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? Oh, you know they are uncircumcised. Yet you married one of them. Be not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. It's still valid. And you're dating one. God again in his mercy created a hollow in the place that was in the jaw and caused water to come out of it. He drunk. His spirit came again was revived. I didn't hear Samson say thank you Lord. How grateful are you? I've trained myself to say thank you Lord. I don't even know how many times a day I say it. I trained myself to do it until it became a part of me. I say it in English, I say it in my native dialect. How grateful are you? Of the things he's done for you. Do you recall to mind his many graces, his many deliverances, his many provisions? Only eternity will show us. I joke about it all the time. If they play back the video of how I drive in heaven, your jaws will be on the floor. It's God that keeps me. I know that one for a fact, if I don't know anything else. When I was younger, I would pull out with an oncoming vehicle. My rationale was, they don't want to die, they'll move. I'm telling you. Do you call to mind the many goodnesses of God so that you can be grateful? Or do you complain and gripe? I told you about the experience with the with the uh, glass of water halfway. They asked a whole bunch of people. Majority said it's half empty. Only a few said it's half full. How do you see the glass in your hand? Is it half empty or half full? He drank it. His spirit was revived. Named the place En Hakore. And En Hakore in Hebrew means the well of him that cried. He named it after himself. He didn't even name it after the God who made such a miraculous provision. The well of him that cried. The well of something. Because I cried. I told you, you need to master your emotions. We were conditioned from when we were children to cry for stuff. Well, they pick you up. Well, they pick you up. 
We're conditioned to cry for things. And many of us carry that into adulthood. We're still crying for stuff. If people don't do what you want them to do, you cry. The Bible says for 20 years he judged the Philistines. He judged Israel in the days of the Philistines. Obviously, he did not annihilate the Philistines because Israel is dealing with them today. God who said, get rid of every single one of them. He knew what he was talking about. He knew exactly what he was talking about. And it may sound somehow to us today. Remember that he sees all of time. Because he dwells outside of time. Questions on chapter 15. Happy has her hand up. Go ahead. So when it says um, <clears throat> the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him, was, was that like him or was it, I'm confused about that, like God intends to use him regardless of his foolishness. And so when, when there was need for the power of God to be made manifest, the Spirit of God would come upon him. You understand? Yeah, I understand. Um, the, Spirit uh... of God, the Spirit of God did not indwell anybody in the Old Testament. Yeah. It's the yeah. born again believer that the Holy Spirit lives inside of. Yeah. Back in the day, no. Did um did it say that when he tore the gates? Because I'm trying to differentiate where, like you said, whether it was like because obviously Samson was um taking advantage of the anointing. And he was he was Samson's you know, anointing. Samson's anointing was manifest in his in human strength or on, on human strength I should say yeah that was how the anointing manifested in his life but he was not disciplined in the use of the anointing that's number one number two whenever God needed to move God would cause the spirit of himself should be manifest in, in Samson's life, whether Samson was doing right or wrong. You understand? He met a lion without anything in his hands, no weapon, no, no tool, nothing. He tore a lion. That, that, that's God's enabling. That's the anointing. Mm -hmm. Because there was need to preserve his life. Yeah. So God preserved his life by empowering him to rip a lion with his bare hands. When he fought a thousand men. Surely a thousand men should be able to, to, to do one man in. But because of the extraordinary power of God. Being made manifest in his physical body. Because of the anointing. He was able to kill a thousand men. With the bone of an ass. So the spirit of God was not resident on the inside of him, but he would come upon him. Oh, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. The spirit of God was not resident inside Moses. But Moses had a constant relationship with God. Moses could go to the tent of the tabernacle and sit down there and wait for God to come and talk to God. We don't know too much about Joshua's uh how the anointing was expressed in Joshua's life, other than the fact that he led the children in many, many wars and they seized quite a, you know, a sizable amount of land. He didn't seize everything. But Mo Mo Moses' Moses's anointing was, was rare. And God said, it's there, I'm going to give you a prophet that there'll be none like him. Man dies, God, God goes to retrieve his body. Nobody knows where his body is. He sent Michael to go and take it back from the devil because the devil stole his body. But he was an Old Testament saint. 
Yet he could walk with God so closely. Not even David. With all the favor from God that he had. Was no prophet like Moses. So that's that's the uh, that's the, the what's the word now? Contradiction that that something was. So every time he had like a no, because it says that he tore him limb from limb. The lion. No, no, no. The people. Um, it said that um after he was gonna take vengeance on on them. He tore them limb from limb and then went down and stayed in the cave. Was that, um, I mean, I'm just making sure that every time he would get, you know, his strength and stuff, it it was the spirit of God that would come over him. Yes. Okay. That was how the anointing manifested in his life, in his life uh, on human physical strength. Any other thoughts, any questions? We'll, we'll take uh, the last chapter that covers his life uh, tomorrow. Any other thoughts? Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll carry on tomorrow with uh, chapter 16. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of this man that we have examined. We have seen where he was of use to your purpose. And we have also seen where he has in, in sheer impudence just lived any kind of life that he wanted to live. Both is represented in us. But we pray, Father, that as we in this house of the Lord follow after you, where our, our mission and, and the paramount goal of our hearts is to know you. Our Lord, you will continue to minister grace to our spirit man, to our soul. You have said we should love you with all of our hearts, with all of our mind, with all of our soul all of our strength. That is to say, reserve no part for nothing else other than you. Help us, Lord, to do just that. In this present world where there are all kinds of flaky stuff going on, Lord, keep us as the apple of your eye, just as you promised. Help us to walk the street and the narrow. To serve you as you deserve. To live for you so that our lives can attract others to the saving grace of your son Jesus Christ. Let not our labor be in vain, Father. Give us the strength Give us the mind, give us the words to be able to share this gospel without fear and without shame. The heart's desire has always been that none should perish. Father, use us for that purpose to the praise and glory of your name. We thank you for I Believe Bible Fellowship. Thank you for how you have kept us this past five years. Convenient, we're convinced and persuaded that you will keep us yet till so Jesus comes or till you call us home to glory. Be glorified in our lives individually and collectively, O oh God. We pray in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. We take up Job 5.12 as you have commanded us, Father, concerning the food we eat, the water we drink, the land that grows our food. Um, the weather, and every other thing that they are tampering with, Lord, that is detrimental to the well-being of your body, the church. 
and your creation, the earth. We speak to the north that you disappoint. The devices of the crafty. Uh, disappointed the devices of the crafty. So that the hands will not the hands perform, the perform the enterprise. Lord, we speak to the south. We say you disappoint. Father, we employ the east wind of God, the wind of destruction. We release it now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to destroy every installation, every warehouse, every laboratory, all over the face of this earth, wherever it is, oh God. That they're doing stuff that is contrary to your will, your plan, your purpose. Let the east wind blow. Thank you. To the east, we say, God disappoints. God disappoints. And finally, we speak to the west. God disappoints. God disappoints. God disappoints. God disappoints. God disappoints. God Thus we have spoken, and thus it shall be done. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a great Monday, and enjoy the rest of your holiday. Um, I'll be there with y'all tomorrow. Say again. Do you want to see y'all tomorrow? Have you go.